<clears throat> Good morning, Kim. Good morning. How are you, Lindsay? Fine, thanks. How are you today? Good. Wonderful. Uh, we are live streaming already. Um, just wanted to make sure we have that up and running. Um, so that's on the Children's Cabinet YouTube. Um, and we have cabinet members joining. Uh, and Melissa is here, but she stepped away for just a moment. So we'll be good to go here in a little bit. Okay. Looks like we got five cabinet members, so I think we have a quorum actually. That's great. Hey, Lindsay, this is Deanne. I just want to give you a heads up. I'm going to join from a second device in a few minutes too. So if you can just be watching for that. Thank you for the heads up. No problem. And one other reminder, um, I, I am going to hit record here um, just before we get started, and it'll probably very loudly in all of your ears say, this meeting is now being recorded. So just be prepared and don't be surprised. <laughs> So far, I count six, so we would have a quorum at nine o'clock straight up if you're ready um, okay. at that point. Terry's waiting. Okay, here she is. Well, good morning, cabinet members and staff and uh, guests around the state. We're um, pleased to call the meeting. We're being recorded. We just got reminded of that here. All right. So, um, I guess Diogo's taking roll. We probably don't need to do that. All right. Uh, why don't we just move right on? Uh, and maybe we'll have one or two more joining us, I would hope here. But um, we have minutes from the October 1st meeting that have been prepared. Uh, there was a second draft of those sent out with a few corrections. Uh, when I hear a motion to approve the minutes. Or so are there corrections? I think Deanne, you said you made you said move to approve. Yes, that's correct. All right, thank you. Is there a second? This is Delise, and I'll second that. Thank you, Delise. All right. Um, why don't we? Uh, we'll do a voice vote on that. I think uh, all in favor of approving the the motion or uh, the minutes, say aye. 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 Hey. Are there any opposed? All right. The minutes are approved. Uh, well, the, today, our, uh, the, the biggest item before us is to take a look at the uh, uh, draft annual report uh, that uh, we received earlier this week, and Jessica Sprague-Jones is going to lead us through that. So, Jessica, we're going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Jessica Sprague-Jones. I work at the Center for Public Partnerships and Research at the University of Kansas, uh, where uh, I have had the absolute pleasure of being on the team that created uh, the 2021 Children's Cabinet Annual Report. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the goal of this report 
is to report the full scope of the Children's Cabinet's work for 2021. Uh, this is only the second year that we've um, reported like this, right? Done like one big report. Um, under uh, Previously, we'd always um, made big, beautiful, glossy reports, but along um, funding lines and in funding streams. But under Melissa's leadership, uh, we've developed this more comprehensive approach to reporting on the work of the Children's Cabinet. Um, this has allowed us to, I think, better convey the true work of the Children's Cabinet, uh, the expansiveness and the way it crosses a, across multiple different efforts and, and connects them. Um, in, in a way that we have um, really tried to emphasize uh, in particular in this document. Another thing that, uh, that is a little bit different about the way we've structured it this year is um, last year, the document was very much about laying out the plan, laying out the vision, um, those kind of big ideas. This year, we really tried to convey that it was a year of action and implementing that plan. Uh, and, and we tried to uh, structure the document um, and, and convey information to convey that sense of, of action um, that we thought was a big message of the year. Um, we also included a special emphasis on new initiatives, data for impact, uh, ch the childcare crisis and relief and recovery. The report notes that the Children's Cabinet was called to take its statutory role to a new level in the past year, uh, in, in part, and in, in no small part, uh, in response to the pandemic, but also as part of the groundwork that has been laid earlier um, in terms of cross-agency collaboration. Uh, and so there were many new opportunities uh, in which uh, the Children's Cabinet was called to identify service barriers, anticipate challenges, propose and implement solutions across agencies and sectors and within communities, uh, with particular attention to three overarching themes, empowering communities across Kansas, collaborating around pandemic relief and recovery, and elevating and supporting the early childhood care and education workforce. This figure presents uh, the, the budget um, over which the, the cabinet, um, the, that the cabinet oversaw in 2021. Uh, really a key point of um, depicting it this way is identifying which it are the ongoing um, parts uh, of the cabinet's budget and which are um, really popping up just in the last couple of years. Uh, so those being the three-year federal grant, uh, the preschool development grant, and one-time federal relief and recovery funding, PDG supplemental award and remote learning grants. Uh, this on top of um, the budget over which um, the cabinet has uh, been the steward for a long time, the tobacco master settlement funding, which funds the children's initiatives fund, and community-based child abuse prevention, which is federal funding to support child maltreatment prevention. The first uh, section of the document is called Our Progress. And the first part is presenting updates on um, across all of the goals of the strategic plan. There are a lot here. Uh, so I'll just kind of lightly go through them. Uh, in terms of goal one around state level coordination, it's building and growing partnerships amongst all state agencies that support families. Uh, that includes uh, ECCE governance structure implementation, the Kansas Common App, and the Kansas Early Childhood Data Trust. Uh, goal two is community level coordination, helping families access the right information to navigate successfully among systems, it includes tools like 1-800-CHILDREN, uh, IRIS, um, and um, links to quality. Goal three, family knowledge and choice, elevating family voice and choice while ensuring equitable access to services includes supporting you, the uh, Sunflower Summer, and the fa and family engagement opportunities. 
Goal four, private sector collaboration, creating opportunities to invest in the future of Kansas kids and families. Uh, important one here was COVID-19 relief efforts, uh, also Kansas Department of Commerce initiatives and Kansas Power of the Positive. Goal five, strengthening families and broadening the reach of early childhood services. Uh, you see a lot here, child care sustainability grants, uh, CARES Act funding, um, and uh, Kansas Connecting Communities grant. Goal six around workforce is developing, supporting, and valuing early childhood professionals. Uh, this includes the workforce registry, uh, child care systems improvement team, and PDG quality subgrants. And group goal seven, quality and environments, is ensure access to safe, stable, and nurturing environments providing high quality services. Again, COVID-19 relief comes up here. Um, as, and remote learning grants and links to quality. This section also includes uh, program profiles for all of the programs that are funded uh, under the Children's Cabinet's portfolio, uh, including 14 Children's Initiatives Fund programs, seven community-based child abuse prevention programs, and 18 early childhood block grantees. Uh, these uh, are, this is information that has been presented to the cabinet at various times throughout the year. And uh, this is the report that captures that information. There are also a lot of new initiatives to report on and they're all, uh, they're kind of scattered throughout this section uh, where they fit of course with the strategic plan. Uh, so Dolly Parton's Imagination Library Expansion, Kansas Future Fellows, Sent Topeka, Preventative Legal Services, Thriving Families, Safer Children, uh, CBCAP demonstration projects and four newly funded CBCAP programs. Uh, the next section is titled Data for Impact. This is um, a, a, a novel to us approach to, um, the, to um, reporting on research and evaluation activities. Um, our, our more typical approach would be um, focused on uh, using research and evaluation results to kind of support a program description, a description of the need in a population, um, which we do in uh, the first section of the document. Uh, we thought it was worth though, giving some attention to the true breadth and depth of the research and evaluation activities that ch the uh, Children's Cabinet supports and, and has supported for some of them, it has supported for many years and, and some of them are quite new and innovative. Um, really multiple different pieces that are all centered around the idea of capturing families' complex needs, uh, set, um, capturing the different aspects of program impact uh, and, and working together to provide a pretty full picture that um, I think I think you'd be hard pressed to find a similar body that is uh, supporting such a full spectrum of research and evaluation activities. I might be biased. So I won't go through this table in detail. Uh, this is reproduced from the report, but really uh, what we're trying to convey with this table is that, um, so this is representing, it's four lines uh, representing five different projects. Um, and it's really intended to convey the idea that these are like not uh, random efforts scattered into the wind. These are really um, distinct efforts that um, are uh, in, that capture different aspects at different kind of units of analysis to understand the full picture of a family's experience of services. Uh, so at the top level, you have the Kansas Early Childhood Data Trust, um, which is going to, which is enabling us to understand family experience across systems and, and across time, right, longitudinally. Um, Our Tomorrow's also a statewide project, uh, but drilling into kind of the depth of family experience, um, the, the personal nuance and, and, and texture uh, 
that uh, they bring to their own data. Uh, the accountability process, state level multi-program evaluation, incorporating evaluation results uh, from very different um, childhood programs, and uh, two multi-site program evaluations, the evaluation of ECBG and of CBCAP, both of which uh, employed shared measurement uh, so they can see both site level and program level uh, results. In this section, uh, we include information about data and evaluation practices for each of the funded programs, uh, detailed information about the common measures, uh, information about the Our Tomorrow's project, uh, both progress to date and plans for the coming year, uh, details and early results of the first Early Childhood Data Trust authorized project. Uh, I, I won't go into that because uh, Dr. Terry Gar Garska will be presenting on that later in this meeting and selected results for each project. So these are some selected results from the accountability process. Um, and you know, again, uh, Dr. Owen Cox presented on some of these results uh, as a part of presenting on the accountability process this summer. Um, the accountability process has been in place since 2006. Uh, it, in some ways, it's really a well-oiled machine. Uh, and I think that can kind of obscure uh, what, um, what it, uh, I'm, I don't want to say challenge, <laughs> it can obscure that this is kind of um, a delicate balancing act, figuring out how to take all of these really uh, distinctive programs with uh, distinctive uh, goals, service delivery methods, populations of interest, uh, which have evaluations that are particularly appropriate for their programs, uh, take all of those pieces and, and turn it into a whole to provide recommendations. Uh, and I think that these results here represent um, some, some of that breadth of uh, what the accountability process captures. So you have the Kansas preschool pilot results. So now these are percentages of students that have shown increases over the course of the year. So 93% of students showed increases in literacy, 93% in mathematics, and 94% in social emotional development. Uh, your child care subsidy, it's a key goal of the program to uh, provide family support so they can um, pursue work and education. Um, so, so for them, they saw a 55% 55 of them saw an increase in their household income over the course of a year. Uh, parents as teachers, 86% of um, had an 86% family retention rate. Uh, Start Young had a 94% educator, educator retention rate. Uh, that feels really huge in the past year. And uh, family preservation, 93% um, of these families uh, were able to have their children remain in the home and 99% did not experience substantiated abuse or neglect during services. Uh, early childhood block grant, again, Dr. Lynn Trefferman presented a really uh, detailed report uh, earlier this year on the ECBG evaluation. So for this report, we really drew from that on, on kind of the key results that felt like captured uh, that, that really detailed evaluation. Uh, so you see um, children on track in terms of social emotional well-being um, ending with 80 an increase ending with 80% of those kids being on track, uh, increases in the number of children who were on track in language comprehension and numeracy, uh, and increases in parents displaying positive parenting interactions from 68% to 86% at time two, uh, and then classrooms achieving high quality increase from 67% to 74% over the course of the school year. The results for the community-based child abuse prevention are new to this document because it's a federally funded program. Uh, the data is on the federal fiscal year. So these are uh, the results of analyses by Dr. Steph Sloan, the CBCAP evaluator. 
Uh, you see here uh, an emphasis on the amount of screening that these programs were able to do. Uh, 582 children um, with 330 referral opportunities. Uh, and then the bar graph on the right is uh, results from the Protective Factor Survey Second Edition. Uh, we thought that this was uh, really a pretty interesting set of results in the context of uh, the pandemic. Uh, we're looking particularly at uh, only 63% of families saying they have adequate social support uh, in, the, in the context of the significant social isolation many families have experienced. That feels really significant. Another one I'd love to provide some context on is nurturing attachment, 57%. Uh, so the items in the PFS2 around nurturing and attachment are items like I have frequent power struggles with my kids. Um, my child misbehaves just to upset me. Uh, how I respond to my child depends on how I'm feeling. Uh, it, it didn't feel um, irrelevant that um, families in quarantine were more likely to agree with attitudes like that. It, it seemed really an environment in which um, many of us had more experiences of power struggles. I might just be speaking about my own home. Next slide. In the Our Tomorrow section, one of the things we uh, really wanted to show off is um, the, the personal narratives are of course um, really uh, interesting and uh, important, but we wanted to give a sense of the broader utility of the tool um, because it is collecting not just personal narrative, but other pieces of quantitative data that help us better understand that personal narrative from the respondent's perspective. So here's an example of a, of a graph that we thought was really interesting. What disrupts a thriving family? And you see the, the bars in gold are for 2020 and the bars um, in blue are for 2021. So you can kind of see what issues have become more or less important over time. Uh, so I think it's interesting that you see health or healthcare issues go from 15% in 2020 to 10% in 2021. Um, there's one that is really pronounced, oh, lack of access to internet or technology. Look at that, 14% of respondents said that that was an issue in 2020 and only 1% are saying it in 2021. Um, in contrast, you see these kind of um, issues that, um, are enduring, pro existed before the pandemic, but the pandemic uh, certainly exacerbated. I'm looking at like mental health issues and childcare issues uh, going from six to 12% on mental health issues, six to 10% on childcare issues. Uh, so in some ways kind of at, representing the fat tail of this pandemic. Finally, I'd point out only 8% of respondents said no one was held back in 2020 and 19% said that in 2021. Jessica, before we move on to that slide, Terry has a question. She's um, asking for the official definition that we use when we say thriving. Um, in our tomorrows, um, I will invite a uh, Jackie counts uh, to weigh in on this. Um, my sense is that this is really a tool that is about respondents' um, self-definition. Um, so, so that would that would be what I would think is that it's really about um, how these fa these families view their own state. Jessica, that's exactly right. Um, the the point of our tomorrows is to really look for surprises and not confirm what we already know. And so it has a very broad prompt. Um, the broad prompt is tell us about a time when your family was thriving or just surviving. And then throughout the, it has a list of questions then that ask about that experience. And the beauty and power behind this is it allows people to make meaning of their own stories. And from that, this is what, um, how they labeled their own experience um, over the past year. And by doing this continuous capture, we've been able to 
compare when it first happened. And we've been able to see various waves throughout the year of how people have experienced um, the pandemic and some of the services that we've been able to provide. Um, and then, yes, a reminder that that um, we just invite questions from the cabinet. So, Delise, if you want to go ahead and ask your question, that would be great. Absolutely. So I'm just curious what no one was held back is referring to. Is that mean meaning that they did not enter into kindergarten the year that they were expected to enter in? Thank you. This is Jackie Counts. Um, what that means is that they weren't, they didn't have a disruptor that held their family back. It is not about children or kindergarten. Can you do a little more context around that? It didn't hold their family back in what way? Like financially, um, there, with education services? Um, we don't really know. And this is something that um, what in what I would like to do is to take these stories back to the communities and to, you know, what, what do people think about looking at the stories that were suggested? Um, what are the points that are making families feel supported? What is the texture behind that? Just to add to Jackie's, this is Melissa, these are self-reported. So families choose the response. So that, that has meaning in terms of um, whether a family felt like one of these other categories created a disruption that that impacted their their ability to function in in terms that they feel is appropriate. That helps. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, so. We um, also included some um, of the substantive results in, in, from our tomorrows regarding um, access to childcare. Uh, and in this one, uh, we include this story. I serve families who struggle financially. Just this past week, a lady quit her job because now that she has her, had her baby, the childcare cost for more than one child tips the income she was making. We need more childcare slots, lots of them, so that the cost will lessen overall. She's not the only one who's had to make this decision, especially during COVID when workers had less hours, more families have made this difficult decision. Uh, and, and we see overall what we're hearing from families through this, through this tool is as access to childcare increased, families said they also experienced increase in social supports and thoughtful planning and the home life becoming more secure. Whereas as access to childcare decreased, Kansas family said that they experienced home life becoming more chaotic, more threatening, uh, more, more things occurring beyond the family's control. Uh, so, so really contextualizing um, the, this story. The final section of the report is, uh, the concluding section is called uh, Supporting Kansans Now and Into the Future. Uh, there are um, reports on the childcare crisis and um, on collabor collaboration around relief and recovery efforts in the past year. Um, it also includes uh, the, the uh, Ch Kansas Children's Cabinet's full recommendations made throughout uh, 2021 thus far. That's all I have. I welcome any other questions. Okay, does anybody have any questions? Let me just note that uh, we're having work done at the house today and I'm as far from it as possible, but I will keep, uh, be muted as much as I can, just in case. Um, what questions or, uh, do cabinet members have or anything they'd like to discuss about the report? I mean, our goal today is to, uh, in effect, uh, uh, get consent to finalize this report and send it to the governor, but we want to have discussion and should there be any suggested changes um, handled uh, right now. So any, any discussion? This is uh, Justice Wall. I, I was just curious, what, what is the target audience for the report? Is it just primarily for the administration um, or how do we traditionally use the, the report? 
Um, great question. I would say yes, it is um, first and foremost a response to our statutory obligation to file a report to the governor. So this um, includes a section with cabinet recommendations made throughout the past year and, and serves as an update um, a recap of, of our activities for 2021, but we have really made a commitment to trying to um, be, create an artifact that can be used as a tool by our partners that can be um, easily absorbed, you know, reviewed and, and, and help the general public learn more about the work we do and and um, just so it is a, a a layered list of of target audience but but first and foremost our our obligation is met um, by reporting this way to the governor thank you what else people have on their minds here Kim, I guess I just would interject and say that that it's our hope that for um, other agencies, providers, parent, it, it, if there are questions that this report spurs, our hope is that this gives a, a comprehensive overview that allows people to understand either where to direct their questions or see the cabinet as a point of contact where we can help connect people to the right, you know, outlet for for more information on something they're asking. So we're we're trying, as Jessica framed up at the beginning of the report, um, we're, we are really trying to show the interconnectedness of our work with with this report. This is Lietta. And uh, I have uh, used this report, sorry, my dogs are making noise in the background. <laughs> um, I've used this report uh, regularly through the years when legislators have questions. It's so nice to be able to say, oh, I have the answer and point right back. So in the comprehensiveness of this, Jessica is great. Thank you so much for the hard work. I can tell, I mean, you have hours in this, so thank you. Other other um, things that I would would love for you to to know is we we will once we have agreed we have a final product we will be printing a limited number of copies so each cabinet member and our our ex officio partners will receive a, a hard copy we'll get that mailed to you and then I keep copies here in the office um, so that if I'm meeting with the legislature or as somebody needs, a, you know, a, a hard copy we, we can provide. So just know that, that um, you will, this will live on the cabinet website uh, and be available that way to everybody. But um, if, if I'm a person who prefers to have a hard copy in front of me, so um, we make sure to make those available as well which is why it's really important to go through it with you and, and give you the chance to, to read through it ahead of today's discussion to ensure that we have, um, if there's anything that you think could be made more clear or if there's anything you think is missing or if we have any final thoughts that we capture them and, and incorporate them before we lock it down. Why don't, uh, Lindsay, could you, uh, or Jessica, one of you, could you find the page that has the briefest statement of the recommendations on it? I think we ought to hold that up here. And um, that is, since it is, a, that, those are recommendations going to the governor through this annual report that we previously approved. But just to remind everybody uh, about that, uh, I I thought the issue, the, the, the the um, material on child care access was um, a, a very, very good synthesis of the issues. Um, I almost wished we had a recommendation on that. <laughs> when I read all of <laughs> I don't think we were quite ready for that, uh, but um, uh, let's see what those recommendations are. 
So Lindsay is uh, working on getting it. I'm sorry. I, up. That's okay. Um, while we're doing that, can I just add that that one item is that we pulled the the cabinet member bios off of our own website, and so if there's anyone who wants an update from from what you originally provided to us, if you want to refresh your bio, um, now would be a great time to let us know. And, and we're happy to make those changes both for the annual report and for the, the website um, where we keep your bios. So just, just know that um, if we've got something that, that is not the most current description, we're happy to make that change. So it, um, the cabinet through the course of the year ha, um, makes recommendations at our meetings. We have voted on things, um, primarily the June meeting recommendations for the, the budget process. But we also, in October, um, we discuss the, the, the common app process and the integration of the Early Childhood Block Grant and the Kansas Preschool Pilot into one joint application. So we have tried to capture the recommendations made through this year. And I, I, um, I don't have anything to add, but I, you know, again, this is that moment for you as a cabinet to decide if, if before this goes on to the governor and then is used as a tool during the legislative session if you think the recommendations are complete or if you have anything else to add. Now, I think you could stick up there with those, those uh, four on top there from June. Those are the ones that are the most uh, complicated and most, you know, I think the... Yeah, we, we had... Um a series of recommendations to recap just for general listeners with the cabinet in June addressed the children's initiative fund budget. And we, we did a couple of key recommendations this year. Number one, the statute actually requires in language that the transfer from the key fund, the Kansas endowment for youth to the children's initiative fund annually is an amount that is equal to 102.5% of the amount transferred the immediately preceding fiscal year. That is outlined in statute and historically has been um, it, it, with the use of a budget proviso and the word notwithstanding that points to, yes, we know the statute says this, but we as a legislature are not going to do that. Um, our ask is that we receive that 2.5% increase to the CIF budget. We then had a series of recommendations that shifted funding um, in partnership with the, the partner agencies. Um, the point being to, to um, make some changes that allow the cabinet a little bit more funding that we have oversight and, and um, decision-making power over to enhance the programs that fit the portfolio most effectively. Um, the, the rearrangement includes a recommendation that we increase the capacity in the early childhood block grant so that we can give more grants to more programs or increase the, the funding for existing programs uh, depending on the, the results of the RFP process and, and the, the will of the cabinet. But we want more grant making capacity there. And we had some specific changes we want additional funding for the universal home visiting program um, because it's highly effective and currently gets very, very little money. So we are trying to move towards expansion so that it, 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 it should truly become universal um, and not universal for a limited number of families that are lucky enough to have services in their area. Um, and then a, a line item that would support 
a, a, the ongoing maintenance for some of the key tools that we have been developing um, with the preschool development grant and, and the work that we're doing. So that's that in a nutshell, that's the recap. Yeah, of those. Uh, those are the, those are the, the financial, uh, primarily financial related uh, recommendation. So anything else? If not, uh, I, I'm, I think we don't need to, this isn't really a legal action. It's really just a procedural step. So I would just look toward unanimous consent, I think on this to finalize and send this report to the governor. Uh, are there any final questions or additions? Well, we've got a mo. We got. She's got me a voting chart up here. I guess. Oh, my I didn't envision. A, I mean, we can do a roll call vote. I just yeah. thought this was a kind of you know, do we consent as a group? Are we in agreement? But um, we can we can handle it this way if you'd like, Kim. Um, I think it's such a quasi staff that you were just really seeking advice and consent. So I'm just going to ask if there aren't any objections to. Uh, um, can I hear a voice? Yes, that we uh, approve this and forward it to the governor. Do I hear cabinet members? Will you respond yes on that for me? Lietta, yes. yes. All right. Deanne, yes. Monica, yes. Terry Rice, yes. Elise, yes. All right. Kim, yes. So uh, are there any opposed? Are we okay? Well, we kind of took an informal vote after all. But anyway, um, uh, it is clearly uh, demonstrated to be the full will of the cabinet unanimously that we do that. So thank you all. Uh, I want to say it is, a, it is a great report. I was struck um, uh, that it, in, in, in some ways, and I don't mean to say this uh, in an overly broad way, but in some ways it really is describing uh, all state government uh, work for, for families and children. And I think it represents uh, the... Um, the coordinating role of the cabinet to do it that way. And um, so I think that was, you know, a real strength of this report is that it is so comprehensive and uh, really deals with not just what we do only, but what we do with all kinds of partners. And I think that's, that's great. So, all right, well, thank you, Jessica, for that presentation. I worried a little bit that the 86 pages or whatever, we might be here till one o'clock. So I appreciate the, uh, your handling of that and appreciate the cabinets uh, uh, preparing ahead of time. I'm sure many of us had uh, looked it over and were fairly conversant with it. And so that, that, that presentation worked fine. All right, um, I understand that uh, for the preschool development grant update that we're gonna first turn to Terry uh, and then Melissa, you may have some things after that, but I think Terry is going to talk to us. Well, let, me, let me just set the scene first. Um, thank you, Kim. I, we, we have been busy and, and that's reflected in the report. We're starting to see um, the fruits of our labors together and um, I appreciate the the coordination and, and the team approach to things with our partner agencies. One of those projects, um, a long held goal has been to create an early childhood integrated data system. And you as a cabinet have um, been a key part of, of that process. So um, we we have brought you information over time about some of the, the work of what the acronym is known as ECIDS. Um, last spring, February or April, I can't remember which meeting, the cabinet approved um, participation in a data sharing agreement under the, the auspices of the Early Childhood Data Trust that we created. Um, last year. So the very first program is what we've invited uh, Dr. Garska to give you more information about. So um, when you read through your annual report draft, this is part of it, but we wanted um, Terry to bring the, the information to you and it, bring it to life so that, that you can understand how excited we are about the potential that exists 
this is a demonstration of what we mean about the power of data. So um, Terry, take it away and, and we'll um, entertain questions from the cabinet at the appropriate time. Great, thank you, Melissa and cabinet. Um, I'm really excited today to present some preliminary findings from the data trust uh, work that we have been doing. So um, as Melissa said, uh, the, pre, uh, the preschool development grant gave us the opportunity to advance our long held dream of uh, stewarding and responsibly sharing data across agencies and partners in early childhood. One of the things, uh, one of my role is um, serving as a technical trustee of the data trust. That means uh, uh, standing up the governance structure and uh, overseeing some of the technical pieces to, to bring that data together and translate it into data for impact for your, for your benefit. Um, and uh, this has, uh, in Kansas, we are uh, data rich. Uh, we have a lot of information about the services that we provide for children and families. Um, the, the issue is that they that data lives in, in multiple houses, if you will, uh, across multiple agencies. And being able to bring that data together, um, much like the annual report, was able to give you the big picture of the cabinet. Um, for, the data trust is, is intended to, to show the system as a whole across agencies and partners serving children and families. And the intent is really to use that data for the betterment of children and services. So um, with that context, uh, the first authorized project uh, um, uh, is um, intended, sorry, Lindsay, could you go back to that before we get into that? Yeah. Uh, so you saw some information about the early childhood block grant evaluation. So for the last six years, our friends at uh, WSU has been evaluating the early childhood block grant. What that means is because the cabinet had the foresight to, um, to measure shared measurement over children over the last five years, we have five years worth of historical data um, in early childhood block grant and CBCAP services. So the, the first question that came out of our authorized project was, do those um, services um, reduce the likelihood of removals into foster care? We know that this is um, one of the questions that's on our hearts and minds in early childhood. Are we preventing um, removals into foster care? So um, what we, if you go next, Lindsay, um, we wouldn't be able to do this. This was a partnership between the children's cabinet and our friends at uh, DCF to come together to share data to, to answer that question. Um, there's a team of us at uh, KU, including uh, uh, my colleagues at CPPR and our colleagues at the School of Social, Social Welfare who um, brought this data together. Next slide. So what we're looking at, as you know, and I don't have to go into the details, we're looking at um, uh, primary and secondary prevention. Uh, at early childhood is primary and secondary prevention. So we have the community-based uh, child abuse prevention program annually, about 900,000, and the early childhood block grant, about 18 uh, million. So that's gonna come in to play later um, as I tease a little bit about um, cost avoidance into other systems of early childhood. So just keep that in your, in your pocket. Next slide, please. So here is the data rich piece. Um, from 2015 to 2021, there were 35,000 children uh, served under uh, ECBG or CBCAP services, birth to six. There was a couple of uh, older kids, but we, we capped it at birth to six. We have a whole um, uh, individual level data um, uh, in DAISY, um, and that was cleaned. Uh, duplicates were removed. Um, we made sure that we had the, the cleanest data possible. We also had a data set from uh, DCF. These were removals into foster care for any reason. Um, during that same time period, 2015 to 2021, there were 14,807 children birth to five in the removal episode data set. 
The reason we have birth to 11 is we wanted to make sure that children uh, in ECBG who might have been uh, five, for example, in 2015, had the um, opportunity uh, um, to appear in the DCF data uh, set if they were removed. So two big data sets. And the intent of the, of the data trust is to bring those data sets together responsibly. Next slide. So before I talk about how they were matched, here's a demographic profile of those two data sets. Um, and of note is that each data set has captures different demographic information. So um, when you bring them together, you can have a complete picture of, of children who appear in both. But when we're looking at them separately, what we're seeing is um, over those six years, those 35,000 children in ECBG, majority of white, a um, uh, little under half are female. Uh, you can see some of the demographics here. 56% um, uh, uh, were on uh, Medicaid in terms of insurance. 6% are TRICARE, that is military uh, insurance. And then when you look at the DCF side, uh, ch uh, children experience and removal, again, majority are white. Um, and some of the demographic profile, 26% had any disability. Okay. So we know uh, the demographic profiles of those um, separate children. Next slide. So when we brought those two data sets together, we had to be very confident. This is called uh, record linking or matching. We needed to make sure that when we, um, when we brought those data sets, when we integrated, this is where the integrated part comes into play. When we matched those two data sets, we needed to make sure that we were um, particularly very, very confident that the child that is in ECBG matches the child that is in DCF and vice versa. And so um, we have a number of steps that we go through to make sure that that is the most accurate um, up to, uh, I haven't quite quantified, but I'm at least 95%, if not higher, uh, confident that they are matches. So matching is, that was done um, uh, by our uh, school social welfare uh, partners. Um, that means matching on names, date of births, um, demographics to make sure that this kid is that that kid. Um, so that was done offsite um, by the school social welfare. And then the study team, uh, which is our, our team received the de-identified data. So as we talk about responsible uh, stewardship of, of data, um, any subsequent analyses were done uh, without any identifiers. So you do need identifiers to be able to match and integrate and be confident. Um, but you then can remove that information and uh, responsibly steward and analyze that data. So we identified uh, the number of, of ECB ch children during that time period who matched in that removal data set. And um, so in it, it, children who were removed at any time, either prior to or after their intervention, uh, ECBG services were counted in an any removal group, okay? Uh, next slide. The, um, the positive is uh, that uh, the majority of ECB ch ECBG children were not removed into foster care during that time period. So 96% of them uh, were not removed. That's great. Um, uh, you can see that about 1,400 of them experienced a, a, any removal for any reason. So um, that's gonna come into play uh, because we wanna talk a little bit more about those children. But this is also um, a, a good a statistic as well. Next slide. Conversely, when we look at the DCF sample, um, that same number, that 1,405, um, what we're seeing here is that's about 10% of that uh, uh, DCF sample. So what that is saying is that only 10% of um, children who were removed during that time period received any kind of ECBG or CBCAP services. Now we know that ECBG and CBCAP are not universal across the state, et cetera. But um, when we start looking at the, um, when we start 
dreaming and thinking about um, how we can uh, better serve children who might be removed, that reach um, will be an important uh, consideration. We don't know uh, currently if any of those children removed maybe had quality childcare or were um, in other pre-K services that were not funded by the cabinet. We only know about the cabinet services. And so that, that is the power of, of being able to uh, bring data from multiple um, uh, funding sources and agencies together to answer the question of whether these children received anything at all. Um, next slide, please. So here's the power again of bringing that data together. We have a more complete um, profile of children who um, received ECBG services and who received CBCAP services. So um, that's bringing the demographic data around disability status and the, um, um, the unique information from the ECBG on insurance to look at those 1400 children who were, who were removed at any time. Again, uh, the majority are white followed by African-American children and so forth. Um, ECBG children, uh, we have a, a category called multiracial. So you can see that that is a significant category that that category does not exist in DCF. But when we pull those together, um, we are able to uh, have a, a richer profile. Um, of note, I would say is 86% um, of those children were on Medicaid. Originally, if you, if you recall, uh, the ECBG children, only 56% of them were on Medicaid, but of those removed, 86% were on Medicaid. And then 21% uh, had any kind of disability. Next slide. So you might be asking, okay, um, how does, what are the removal reasons for this, uh, for this sample? And uh, essentially it mirrors um, the DCF sample. So this is a distribution of some of the top removal reasons that we see um, in the DCF sample, which is gold. And in the, the match sample, that 1400, uh, that's blue. So essentially you're seeing the same distribution frequency of removal reasons. Again, for uh, children birth to six, majority is um, neglect. A maltreatment, followed by um, the parents' drug addiction and caretaker illness and physical harm and abuse. So the patterns are um, similar. I mean, there's a, a couple of uh, differences in, in here between the two groups, but the, the distribution is, is similar. Um, these are preliminary, preliminary findings, so we haven't dug in. Uh, you might have some questions. We haven't dug in uh, deeply on this yet. So um, uh, know that that is on our mind. Next slide. So here, here's the thing. We then needed to test whether or not, the ultimate question is, does participation in early childhood block grant and CBCAP reduce the likelihood of removals into foster care? So we had to have a, a design behind that, that test, that question. So a case control design um, is essentially determining whether or not exposure to ECBG services, e ECBG CBCAP uh, services, that intervention was associated with a reduction in the likelihood of, uh, of any re uh, um, removal, not just child maltreatment, but any removal into foster care. So that's the design that we use to test that. And then we coded uh, on our 1400 children, we coded whether the removal occurred before or after they received services. Okay. Um, in terms of this design, any uh, uh, child that was removed before they had a chance to be uh, served uh, with services, that's our control group, that's our comparison. So um, when we, uh, we compared that to uh, a children who, uh, a ch children who uh, experienced a removal after intervention, those are our cases, okay? So go to the next slide and here's a visual. So, uh, it's a little uh, wonky with a, a line in the middle there that got kind of went to the left. But essentially, um, what you're looking at is those 3,500 children 
and, and then two, two groups to compare. The intervention is in the center where uh, that line would be. That's the exposure. So what we would expect if, if, um, if those two groups um, had no differences, we would, we would expect them to look the same. So let's, uh, let's go to the next slide. I'm not the uh, uh, first, we needed to make sure that those two groups were equivalent. Um, and that means, did they differ on any of the demographic uh, characteristics which might cause differences in their uh, removal status? They were not different. So those that children that were removed before intervention and removed after intervention were equivalent in terms of uh, their demographic profile. Then we calculated an odds ratio test to see whether the exposure to the intervention of ECBG reduced the likelihood. Um, next, next slide. So this is the statistical test. We compared the odds of children being removed before intervention, the control, with the odds uh, being removed after intervention, the cases. So essentially, the null hypothesis for, um, for folks who um, uh, like to, to talk about null hypotheses, which you're listening to one of them. Um, if the intervention itself had absolutely no effect, if early childhood services made no differences, those two groups would um, have an equivalent likelihood of removal. The, uh, the odds would be even. They may or may not be removed. So if, if, if the intervention had no difference, um, the odds ratio would be one. That means they, they're even odds that they would be removed before or after. However, this is the critical test. If the um, intervention itself had a protective effect, there would be a lower likelihood of a subsequent removal after ECBG, after the intervention. That's called the benefit hypothesis. Um, and the odds ratio would be less than one. Um, I'll repeat that as we get uh, closer, but this is the critical test because the, uh, you know, we, given that we know what the outcome is, we can't randomize the children into, re right? We can't randomize. This is um, one of the, the, the strongest uh, methodologies we have right now to look at um, whether or not, uh, it, this is not causal, this is about um, association and likelihood, but this is the right uh, methodology and statistics to be able to say, uh, to test this very hypothesis that early childhood services does or does not um, uh, make a difference in removals into foster care. Okay. Here's the big bang. Um, uh, it doesn't look like a big bang, but it is. So stick with me here. Children had a significantly lower likelihood of being removed after receiving services. That's the spoiler alert, but that's also the deal here. So um, the odds ratio uh, is 0.77. So if you remember, uh, if it's a protective effect, if East, the intervention protects children, uh, the likelihood of children being removed, we should see a lower likelihood um, and a lower odds ratio. So 0.7, that is statistically significant. So these two groups, um, the before and the after, uh, what we can say is that um, intervention had an impact, had an effect, not a causal, um, but when we're talking about odds ratios and when we're talking about likelihoods, it's reducing the likelihood of removals. So um, one, this is why we do the work um, because we know that it matters. And two, um, this is the first time that we've been able to have Kansas data to show this kind of, um, this kind of uh, effect that early childhood services matter. And if you think about, um, uh, this is only a subset of early childhood services in Kansas. This is ECBG and CBCAP. We know that quality childcare matters. We know that pre-K matters. We know that uh, home visiting matters, et cetera, et cetera. If this is what we're finding with ECBG, can you imagine what we should be finding um, with other, uh, other services? And also teasingly, um, when you start looking at um, 
the, the cost avoidance of foster care and entry into foster care. I mean, I, I'm talking to the, um, the choir here, uh, but this is the kind of information that when we start thinking about where should we play, I start thinking about where should we be placing our investments um, uh, in a way that makes a, a difference. Prevention, of course, is always on our mind. And uh, this is evidence for that. So next slide is kind of the uh, recap. And if you wanna take away kind of the big picture, so ECBG, and this is, I'm saying the same thing, but in a different way when you interpret odds ratio. Uh, ECBG services significantly reduces the likelihood of removals into foster care by 23%. Okay. Conversely, the odds of a child being removed without uh, ECBG services in place increases, increased by 29%. That's how you interpret that. And what is critical um, it is 181 children. So that's the difference between the kind of the before and the after group. 181 children would have been more likely uh, to have been removed had they not received the ECBG services, which um, I know that we, matters to all of us. Um, this, this particular number, for example, if you're starting to think about, uh, and in the annual re report, you'll see a little bit of teasing of cost avoidance uh, estimates, that when you start thinking about the cost of a, ch a child going into care, you multiply that by 181 uh, children. Um, also, we know that the CDC has some costs around um, uh, removals and maltreatment uh, the, around healthcare costs, special education costs, juvenile ju uh, criminal justice costs, but also quality of life. I mean, there are, there are, there are dollar sign costs, but there's also uh, tangible costs around, um, uh, intangible costs around uh, trauma, ACEs, uh, quality of life. So um, just a teaser, the CDC, uh, their most recent um, re research shows the lifetime cost of removals into foster care due to maltreatment is $830,000, which I mean is probably a conservative effort uh, estimate. Um, but when we start putting together numbers of what that means in, in Kansas, 181 times you know the average per child cost into foster, removals into foster care, um, potentially the health uh, costs of neglect. Um, um, you know, we're, again, there's money cost and then there's, uh, there's um, avoiding children experiencing removals and trauma. Um, so the big takeaway of course, is that early childhood services, as we know it, ECBG, CBCAP, acts as a significant protective factor against removals uh, into foster care in Kansas, which I know matters to all of us. So what's next? Lindsay is our next slide. Um, as you can imagine, that was only the tip of the iceberg. That was the big tip though. I mean, that was the, um, that was the, the, the big bang. However, um, there are many other questions that probably are in your mind right now um, and in other folks' minds um, that uh, we have the ability to answer. That is the power of the, of the data trust. And again, this is only the preliminary findings. I hope um, in, the future, in a future meeting to be able to present some more detailed uh, findings that we have um, because some of the questions might be, um, which interventions are most productive in reducing the odds? Um, what are the cost avoidance forecasts? Um, if investments in ECBG remain the same or increase or decrease, um, what if any other early childhood supports did the children removed um, uh, into uh, by uh, DCF receive? How might the outcomes have been different? These are the kinds of things that we intend to um, to explore more deeply. And this is the power of uh, the Early Childhood Data Trust here in Kansas. So it was an honor to do uh, this study and present these preliminary findings to you. And I will uh, hold if there are questions. 
Thank you, Terry. This is Melissa. I would just um, close the, the presentation part and segue to discussion by saying this is just one example of the power of data sharing between, it's just one partner agency, but the point of forming the data trust is that we, we by piloting a project to explore how the trust functions, the governance of it, the process of all of that, um, you know, what, what is needed to match data, clean the data, um, all of that, and then translate it into um, different research questions that might involve additional data sets as, as we think about um, how kids do um, with health outcomes or how kids do with education outcomes. There, there is a whole world uh, available to us as we begin to refine the process. And I do want to make sure there is a, a clear disclaimer. I never see the, in, the specific data at, here at the cabinet. We are not the recipients. The, the team that receives the data to work with are all um, equipped to to work with that data in a highly confidential manner in accordance with all prevailing federal and state laws around data governance as well as you know ethics and best practices so um, all of the privacy concerns um, are are top of mind and and um, foremost in in the um, manner in which the work is addressed. So with that, um, Cabinet, this is time for questions. Okay, let's see if we have any questions. Terry? This is Justice Wall. I, I am kind of curious whether you had the opportunity to um, explore whether the intervention was more or less effective based on the grounds for removal. Um, that may be beyond the scope, but do you understand the question? I do. And um, that uh, we, we received, um, this is based on the data from DCF. So we received a, a couple of data sets and, and I know that uh, Tanya Keys is on the, uh, on the call as well around um, intake uh, findings and then removals. Um, so I think what you're asking is, are there differences based on the removal reasons? Um, right, that's, uh, those are very good questions. Again, uh, we have an, uh, haven't dug as deeply into the analyses yet. We wanted to like, we're basically, we're doing this to get to this point uh, so that um, we could give you guys the nuggets, but also um, create the, uh, the kinds of questions. We wanna hear what questions the cabinet has to be able to, uh, and, um, and you all, to be able to uh, direct our analyses. And, and that is certainly a top of mind. And I've started digging into that a little bit, but we're not at this point to be able to, to present. I have some, I have some, um, I, we did look at differences between the removal reasons of the before and after group, um, uh, teasing, uh, preliminary um, child behavior problems uh, were greater in the after group. Um, however, in uh, the uh, removals due to uh, a parent's drug problems were less in the after group. So that suggests potentially that uh, some of the early childhood services might have um, uh, supported uh, parent um, parent education and um, uh, recovery, and also incarceration of a parent was reduced in the after group. So, I, I mean, we can't draw too many conclusions yet on that, um, but those are the ones that stuck out. Thank you. Hi, this is Monica. I just want to tell you this, this is just fantastic. I mean, just, just simply, um, I don't know, just kind of like feels like this is why we do what we do. And so thanks for putting it in bullet format because so many people only hear and listen and read in bullet format. So I hope this information is shared um, with committees in the legislature, specifically the foster care group 
Um, I think that the mental health modernization folks need to hear this because there is so much um, work that's done in the field around infant toddler mental health and social emotional growth of, of little people and their families. So I hope that this is just shouted from the rooftop every chance possible. And with that in mind, is this set of slides available at this point in time? It, it like all of our, our materials, this will be posted to the cabinet website um, at the close of the meeting as soon as um, the team is free to, to post it. And um, yes, um, this will serve as a fantastic foundation um, to help educate lawmakers. Um, I, I, I certainly will be having those conversations. I know we have um, partners who will also have access to this data that can use it in their own work. Um, I encourage all of you to, to reach out and let us know if, if we can support any of you in, in um, any of the efforts that um, you are engaged in advocating for um, the things needed to expand the universe of services to serve more children and families because it is very clear that, that the work we do and have been doing for many years um, matters a great deal. This is Delise, and I just want to say it, it is a great report and really good data. And I, what I think I appreciate the most about this is hearing that you're now thinking about ways that you can use these data to drive your next set of questions as far as how you can delve deeper into this to figure out what initiatives are specifically working and tweak the, the services that we're delivering to kids. So thank you for your work. It's awesome. Thanks, Delise. Um, I would I would say this is um, of all the work that that we're engaged in, and and all of it is um, significant and important to me. This is the the particular project that um, I adopted early on in the PDG universe to help shepherd, and and I. I am so excited about the future potential um, because as Terry noted, even just for this particular research question, there are other data sets that we could be looking at that um, other, other agencies, other programs and services that um, I don't want people to think that we are oblivious to the work being done with other streams of funding and other programs because um, we are keenly aware that if we began looking at a larger data set, additional support programs and services, that, that the, the impact of the data will just get stronger. Hey, anything else? Yeah, Kim, this is John. Can you all hear me? Oh. I've been having crazy Zoom issues today. So, um, and so forgive me if this question was asked and I missed it as I was trying to fix audio issues, but is there anything, I, I think this, the, the, the research is fantastic, that uh, the findings are promising. And I wonder um, if there's anything that uh, would be a roadblock to keeping the data trust in place long-term or anything that we need to be aware of uh, to make sure that we can continue to have this strong alignment across agencies and make sure the data trust exists in perpetuity? That's a fantastic question, John. Um, and this is Melissa. I would, I would um, very delicately phrase this as um, that, you know, it is, it is entirely dependent on a willingness among our agencies as a group to partner together to, to get the work done. It also will require funding, which is why we put the infrastructure line item recommendation in our cabinet um, budget recommendations, because these studies cost money. We have to employ the, the, um, the research team to, to conduct the study. Um, we need to pay for um, different aspects of the data um, processing that happens. And, and you know, there, this doesn't come free. So we need, we need capacity 
financially to conduct this work. We are limited at the moment with um, the funding that we have available. We're getting very creative with how we might use certain streams of one-time federal funds to keep this moving. Um, but you know, those come with strings we need to vet and make sure we have approval from federal partners before we can proceed. So um, I would be looking, I, you know, given the, the prevalence of, of legislative requests for data to support funding requests, um, we know we have the power to, to bring that data to the conversation so that we can really have a, a, a conversation about where we want to head as a state, where we want to um, place, um, put our money in, in order to achieve the goals everybody, I, I think across partisan lines, people want children to have better, safer, um, happier childhoods um, for all concerned. And, and so uh, we have some pretty good ideas about how we make that happen. And um, I think that conversation is worth having. Any other questions? This is Lietta and Terry, amazing job. It's just nice to see Kansas data. It, that's what I'd like to say. It just, it's nice to say, yes, we know generally globally investment matters. And I love to think of it. A lot of times I hear return on investment and cost avoidance, but you know, you framed it beautifully in other ways as well that articulate just the material goodness of investing in early childhood. So thank you. This, this was like getting your doctorate in a short amount of time, wasn't it? <laughs> thank you, Terry. All right. Well, we'll, we'll look forward to future, future questions being answered. Terry, thank you for all your work today. All right, we have a chance now for agency updates. Um, are we, is there a list of the agent? There we go. That always helps me. I'm trying to compare who's on here and get it, get it in order here. So Amanda, uh, do you have something from the Department of Ed? Good morning, everybody. This is Amanda Peterson at the Kansas State Department of Education. I have three things for you today. Uh, the first piece we're really excited about. Some of you all might recall that back in 2018, as the, the Kansas legislature was reviewing and updating the Kansas uh, school finance formula, there were adjustments made to the preschool aged at risk program. Uh, this used to be known as the state pre-K four-year-old at risk program, but in 2018, the legislature updated that statute to allow for funding three-year-old students who meet at risk requirements in the future. As a reminder, that's based on the September 20th count date uh, in districts that are operating uh, approved programs, which is about 250 of our 286 school districts. Um, the, if a district has an approved program, then the students who meet those at-risk criteria who are enrolled and attending on September 20th are each counted as a one-half student in the school finance formula. Obviously, there have been disruptions to enrollment during the pandemic, and we've been closely monitoring those. In mid-November, the Kansas State Department of Education announced to our school districts that uh, for this current school year and moving forward, we'll be able to fund those three-year-old students uh, who are enrolled in approved programs on September 20th and who meet those at-risk criteria. So this is a really big deal. It's the culmination of uh, many years of work. And it's, it's exciting that we're able to move that forward. And we're, of course, encouraging uh, school districts as they're considering what this means moving forward uh, to be working, continuing to work in partnership with other community partners to understand the best possible mix of providing those preschool slots in their community to support kindergarten readiness. So that's the first update. The second update is that 
Um, the Kansas State Department of Education spent the month of November highlighting kindergarten readiness. So stakeholders can go to www.ksde.org and they'll see news stories on the front page. There's a really great combination. Our, our communications team did a phenomenal job connecting with partners and really being able to tell the story of the ways that different communities are focusing in on kindergarten transitions or expanding access to developmental screening. So I think there will be a lot of great highlights um, that, that cabinet members might be interested in. And then the, uh, the third and final piece is one that we're really excited about. Uh, I visited before about the Kansans Can Star Recognition Program, which is an opportunity for districts to be and, and private school systems to be recognized in the areas that Kansans have told us that they value, that set our Kansans Can vision uh, for leading the world and the success of each student. At the November board meeting, the Kansas State Board of Education recognized more than 100 school districts as excelling in these areas, including 16 districts who were recognized in the area of kindergarten readiness. These districts uh, completed a fairly extensive self-assessment and then provided artifacts and data that uh, KSDE staff were able to review. Uh, and we are thrilled that these 16 stepped up and pr produced that application were recognized. And we are reminding everybody that if they're interested, uh, the next round of applications will open December 15th and be due in June. So we look forward to recognizing addi additional districts in the future. If anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. My email address is apeterson at ksde.org or I'm happy to answer questions here too. Thank you, Amanda. Any, any questions for her? All this right. is Monica. Uh, oh, yeah. Kim, I just want to say a big thank you to Amanda. She put that off as a, you know, one, one bullet in her presentation on the three-year-old at-risk funding, but this is a game changer in school districts. I get the opportunity to work in school districts every day, and every day since this has been announced, I've had some kind of inquiry, phone call. This is a big, big deal. So thank you to Amanda and the team for making that policy actually be able to play out. It's It's been talked about for a lot of years. So thank you for doing it. Thank you, Monica. And I'd be absolutely remiss if I didn't recognize that um, I'm looking at two former state representatives here on the Zoom who played a huge part in making that decision happen in the legislature. And then here at KSDE, I can see on my phone that Natalie McLean is on the phone with school districts right now. Our school finance team and our auditing team have been phenomenal. So it really is a full team effort to make this happen. For sure. Amanda, just a quick note. If you get me, if there's a press release or a listing of the 16 schools that earned the, the kindergarten readiness um, recognition, I would be happy to add that to the cabinet website. Oh, terrific. Absolutely. Yes. And if folks are interested, they can go to ksde.org um, and flip through to the November 9th press release and summary of the board meeting. But I'll certainly send that to you, Melissa, so that we can include it in the minutes. All right. Well, our own Amy Meek here. What would you bring to the cabinet's attention? Good morning. I'm Amy Meek. I'm with the Children's Cabinet Trust Fund. And um, first, I'd like to say that the reports this morning and presentations um, certainly energize me and, and hopefully others. Um, this is the why we do this work. And I've been at the cabinet since 2015. So it definitely emphasizes um, uh, why, why are we why we're doing this work in, in investing um, and supporting programs and I I'd like to just uh, thank our programs too that we fund because they're the ones that collect all the data and work really hard to do that for us and so um, and not and and deliver the services of course so um, hopefully this also energizes them as well um, I have one update from our last meeting and that's on the early childhood block grant and Kansas preschool pilot common application. Uh, we did release that um, on November 1st and um, uh, met our deadline and that will close on December 20th. But um, as of yesterday afternoon, I looked and between uh, myself and our support at KUC PPR and um, Amanda and Natalie on, on her team, we have addressed about 70, probably a little bit more um, individuals that have reached out and Amanda's smiling because um, we had some some this morning and, and um, we're really um, wanting to address those as soon as they come in because we know that uh, programs are working hard on, on those applications. And so um, they vary across the board on what, what support they need and, and we've been able to um, 
tag team that. And sometimes it's a joint effort and making sure that we um, can assist them as this is, is new, the budget document that they're filling out is new. And so, um, so that's um, been going well and we will continue to um, uh, take their requests up until the application closes. Um, we are also wrapping up our fall evaluation cycle for the early childhood block grant. We, we collect data throughout the entire year, but we ask grantees um, in December to make sure that they've entered everything that they've collected since the beginning of um, their programs um, starting in July or August. Um, and then that, that way, um, WSU can help us look at it and make sure that everybody's um, on track or identify any issues um, or um, assistance that grantees might need. We were able to um, onboard our one new grantee, Phillips Berg, and um, they have successfully collected and entered um, what we've asked of them into DAISY. So, um, so that also uh, went really smoothly. And lastly, we are on, um, in the process of onboarding our new um, CBCAP uh, programs and projects. We've been scheduling meetings with them one-on-one -on -one to make sure that they um, have a solid plan for uh, their scope of work and um, developing a evaluation plan for them as some of them um, are very, very unique. Um, and then also just getting them familiar with our CBCAP programs and our reporting and, and um, support that we can provide. Um, we're planning to gather all of the CBCAP programs um, sometime in January for just a virtual uh, meeting um, so that they can, we can welcome the new programs, orientate them to any evaluation changes and, and review the tools um, and discuss our uh, technical assistance um, that we have planned. And then lastly, we're working on the end of the year federal report um, that's due in January for CBCAP. And so our um, KUCPPR helps us with that. And, um, I think we're on track to get that hopefully submitted even early. So okay. that is my. Rachel was pulled into the agency business this morning and sends her regrets that she could not be with us. Um, and we have Dr. Carla Whiteside Hicks in for DCF today, I believe. Yes, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, you're right. Secretary Howard was unable to join us this morning. Um, I just have a couple of updates. Want to talk about the um, sustainability grants that we have been able to provide direct support to our providers. So round one of our sustainability grants, which were funded by CURSA dollars, um, that, that round is closed. Um, and the last payments, the final payments were issued on October 29th. Um, so in all, we issued um, $43 million, about $43.5 million directly to providers to support their child care facilities. And that was um, that served 3,160 um, providers who were approved for funding. Round two um, of those sustainability grants is being funded by the American Rescue Plan. Those initial payments just went out this week on November 30th, and 3,489 providers received funding, and that funding totaled just over $43 million. So we're really excited about being able to support providers to keep their doors open, um, to, um, to uh, provide uh, supplies, things that they need to be able to provide quality care for the, the families and the students that they serve. And that's all I have. Okay, uh, Carla, thank you. I'm just gonna just take one minute here. Uh, Rachel's absent, but I, I, I would feel very remiss if I didn't just make a couple comments that uh, she's uh, leaving KDHE, uh, announced that I think about a week ago, maybe, maybe 10 days ago. Uh, and uh, I had worked with uh, Rachel in, in my job at United Methodist Health Ministry Fund for a number of years. And then of course I've enjoyed her participation and uh, I just I just want to say she's uh, she's just been collaborator supreme with a clear focus on what she's trying to accomplish and uh, she 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 made government a, a good a good word uh, surely in everybody's in everybody's vocabulary because uh, she viewed it as a base from which much could be accomplished uh, not much could be regulated, uh, not, not so heavy on the regulation maybe, but more toward the, what could we get done and uh, reasonable regulations, what I should have said. Uh, anyway, I just think she's presented a, a wealth of talent to our state. And I, I know KDHE will uh, find people to pick up those, those jobs, but I do wanna just 
thank her. Uh, it's being recorded so she could see it if she wanted to. Uh, thank her for all her efforts uh, for the cabinet, uh, for KDHE, and uh, for Kansas. So anyway. I think I'm still in denial. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, uh, yeah. Secretary Howard, are you with us today? No, we're, we're on to Dr. Wiscom. Okay. Carla, it's all yours. I I'm ready, thank you so much. Um, the thing that is important for us to know, and I think everybody's probably heard about the Promise Act and that one of the eligible programs is early childhood. Our Board of Regents approved all the programs at their June meeting. And I would say a majority, if not all of our two-year institutions submitted a program that was approved for this. So. It's very early in the stages. I know there will be some things to work out, but we're very excited about the scholarships that will are available to students that um, are choosing these programs. And part of that requirement if, of the scholarship is that they remain in Kansas and work for a couple of years. So we're excited about that and just crazy busy trying to work out the implementation stages of that. But that is all I have for today. Carla, I would just, this is Melissa, I would simply offer that we stand ready to assist if there are questions and, and um, areas of support where our team, um, specifically the cabinet, but the agency collaboration writ large, um, uh, we we are really excited that child care is or child development is an approved track for that scholarship program and it is a key piece of recruitment efforts so we are looking at a, a whole world of issues related to workforce recruitment and retention so um, I, it, they're probably can and should be opportunities for us to team up and, and address way, yeah. elements of it. So keep us posted. We appreciate that. Thank you for that offer. Thank you. All right, uh, Justice Wall. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just a few items that we'll pass on from the judicial branch. Uh, last time up at the last meeting, I think we mentioned that uh, proposed amendments to rule 174 um, were proposed and those have been adopted and finalized and will be effective at the start of uh, January. And the idea there was to require district courts to use judicial counsel forms when they make uh, findings and orders in child in need of care cases, uh, because uh, the district court judges have to make very specific and particularized findings uh, to ensure that the families and children uh, receive and can continue to receive federal benefits. So we think that passage of that rule will just help ensure that those benefits continue to those families in need. Um, second, uh, the Office of Judicial Administration asked me to pass along that uh, each year they publish a guidebook that contains the updated uh, child in need of care and juvenile offender codes. And we just got the revisor's office updates to the statutes. And so those books will be published again, uh, probably early on in 2022. And as traditionally we've done, they'll be distributed to stakeholders uh, through local CASA programs or those without a CASA program through um, CSO offices. Um, third item, uh, we are planning in 2022 to update CASA and CRB standards, the statewide standards. Uh, so we will anticipate recommendations coming to our court in early 2022 uh, to sort of modernize and update uh, those standards. And finally, OJA also wanted me to pass along that they will host training for child welfare stakeholders, the best practices in child welfare law is the seminar that they conduct twice a year. And those dates have been set uh, April 19th and 20th and August 23rd and 24th uh, for those stakeholders. And the topics I believe have been finalized as well. And that's all I have from- Oh, thank you. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you. Good items brought to our attention. Um, 
For now, uh, Hope, are you from Juvenile Justice? Yeah, hi, thanks. I have just a couple of things. I wanted to first um, take a moment to express my excitement for the data that was shared earlier. Um, excellent, excellent data. Um, and of course, my mind starts going, um, how can KDOC partner and start sharing um, further into the system, but we certainly have intake data that um, would match very well with this study. And so certainly looking forward to um, moving that forward and that partnership forward. Um, and then just an update on um, the grant prevention grant opportunities that I believe um, Melissa was able to share with you guys the last meeting that I was unable to attend. So we have two prevention grants out there right now. One was a million dollar non-match and one was $500,000 dollar for dollar match. Um, those went out um, as a separate grant opportunity outside of community corrections, which are normal grant opportunities. Um, so this was open to community providers as well as governmental agencies. Um, we are reviewing those right now. We did re receive a decent amount of applicants. We received about 19 applicants. So we'll be reviewing those and funds will be distributed in January. So we should be announcing those here um, shortly. Um, so those are the, the two areas that I just wanted to speak to. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hope we're going to take you up on your offer. So um, <laughs> absolutely. We will be calling on you. Thank you for that. Yeah. We're just having collaboration work right here in the meeting. That's good. That's great. Thank you, Beth. All right. Anybody else that uh, isn't on the list here? I, I'm, I don't have full uh, access to everybody on the call here, I don't think. But anyway, all right. Thank you for all those reports. Uh, Debbie, are you bring us up to date on the Early Childhood Advisory Council? Good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, I want to be able to share some updates with you today. I have a few um, fairly exciting ones, I believe. So uh, just a reminder to anyone listening in that the Early Childhood Recommendations Panel is um, serves as an advisory group to the Children's Cabinet, and all of our meeting materials can be found on the Cabinet's website, and we meet on the third Fridays of every month in the mornings from 9 to 1130. So ever since August, um, we have, I've been telling you about the three work groups that were formed this year in the the panel, and those are focused in the areas of child care recruitment and retention, family partnerships, and quality and environments. And so those groups uh, meet during the second hour of our regular monthly meetings, and they've been working towards the outcome of developing recommendations or action plans that they will present um, to the full panel for discussion and revisions as needed, and then if approved by the full panel, they would be elevated to all of you for approval, uh, similar to the process that we followed with the Kindergarten Transitions Toolkit last year. And so uh, I want to visit with you a little bit today about some of the potential recommendations uh, that the work groups are discussing that you might see coming your way in the near future. So from the Child Care Recruitment and Retention Group, they are exploring three main ideas to develop. The first one of those is insurance and retirement, such as CAPERS, for uh, the child care workforce. Um, also, loan forgiveness for educators who work in settings other than school districts. And then um, bonuses and raising wages for the uh, child care workforce. And this is an ongoing priority conversation throughout the entire early childhood network in Kansas. So they're researching these ideas and um, wanting to narrow those down and then start developing recommendations around those. They are also having very meaningful conversations on the importance of a public awareness campaign for these ideas, because all of these uh, strategies would need the support of the general public and also those in positions of authority who make funding decisions. Um, and using that campaign to really be able to help all of those folks understand the importance of early learning as a field for new professionals to want to join. Um, you know, and, and hearing about the Promise Act is very exciting for that. Uh, they have also had conversations around retention of providers and the time that it takes to onboard a new professional 
and the investment that an employer has to make uh, during that process of hiring a new employee and the support that they might need from all of us uh, for that to look successful. And so moving on to the family partnerships group, they have talked a lot about all of the great resources that we have in Kansas and how to connect those dots for families. Um, the importance of helping families navigate those resources and not losing sight of how being able to help them do that can um, alleviate a lot of the stress that that causes because finding and accessing those resources takes a lot of effort on their part. And then their second focus area is to identify a common definition of family partnership within the agencies who provide those services and using that definition uh, for a common shared language um, among all of the agencies and organizations working with families. The quality and environments group is focusing more on an action plan rather than a recommendation. Um, and that would be to partner with the state and local interagency councils, better known as the ICCs, on how they can be a resource to share more broadly and connect with child care providers throughout the 30 communities in Kansas that have active local ICCs at this time. So similar to the connecting the dots um, concept from the family partnerships work group, there's been a lot of conversation from this group. Um, they're calling it a one-stop shop um, with concept within these communities to help families and children who have special health care needs, as well as the providers and organizations who work with those families. They also want to include in this action plan the suggestion or recommendation to the uh, local ICCs to consider scheduling some of their regular meetings outside of the normal nine to five work hours so that that could better accommodate uh, the participation of families and providers in those meetings. And then also the action plan would address uh, the in including the development of working with the state ICC to uh, secure some funding resources that to help support the local ICCs in some of those efforts that they're recommending. So the hope is that these work groups will um, finalize these recommendations at their December meetings this month on the 17th and then elevate them to the full panel. And then eventually, uh, maybe in early 2022, uh, whatever's ready, bring that to this group. And I just wanna take a second to commend the members of the panel and these work groups on their commitment and passion to developing these ideas. And they not only address strategies within the All In for Kansas strategic plan, and a lot of those were referenced in the annual report that we heard about earlier, um, trying to tackle some of those challenges that are going on. And then, um, but also just ongoing, they want to enhance in any way that they can the, the quality of services to families and providers in, in to the future in the state. So um, they're, it's, it's really going well. And uh, we're excited to be able to report out on some of their accomplishments and excited to bring that to you um, very soon. Uh, moving on, we had a great meeting uh, recently on November 19th. Dan Worry, who I understand has a history with some early childhood work in Kansas, and some of you are probably familiar with that. Um, he's from the Hunt Institute, and he gave a great presentation on the Build Back Better Act, which coincidentally had just been passed by the House of Representatives uh, that morning about an hour before we met. So it was very fresh off the press. And uh, his presentation was followed by a long question and answer session with panel members. And then after the break, the members decided to forego the work group um, meetings during the second hour of that month and continue the conversation that was facilitated by Amanda Peterson, and they developed a list of questions to consider and to be used as a starting point when developing the Kansas Implementation Plan for this act. And so the opportunity for individuals and agencies and organizations to continue adding to this list that was developed in a, is going to be in the way of a survey that will be made available and shared out on the various All In for Kansas Kids platforms very soon. And so. I would, in your spare time, highly encourage you to, to go to the cabinet's website and take a look at this meeting, at the recording from this meeting and 
um, you know, just kind of hear about what he presented. It was great information. And then when the survey is made available, we want to get that to you and welcome any ideas that you might have to share with us on this topic. Or um, in the meantime, you're also welcome to send those to my email, which I can put in the chat. And I'd be happy to uh, collect those from you. So at your October meeting, Kim asked the question about the feedback that was being received on the uses of the Kindergarten Transitions Toolkit. And so a couple of weeks later at the monthly panel meeting, we had a feedback session with members to uh, gather some responses. And so some of the things that they shared with us, one of um, a Lawrence Child Care Center director said that their community has begun the Kindergarten Transitions team this past year. And they learned that that process is uh, larger than what they initially thought. And as they're starting to look at the toolkit and use it, they've uh, decided that they're not quite ready to write an MOU yet. Uh, they said that developing those relationships on the team, kind of identifying what some roles are of different team members, uh, doing a needs assessment, those kinds of things would um, build the trust that they would need to be able to agree on an MOU agreement. And uh, they just think overall it's going really well and they would highly recommend the toolkit to other communities. And they've also identified some potential um, materials that we might be able to add to it at some point in time that would um, Im improve on it. Uh, one of the uh, other members on the panel an Olathe home-based childcare provider suggested that maybe we need to somehow provide some more explanation about what the MOU means to providers. Um, she thought that would be helpful on, you know, information on the toolkit, the MOU, and how child care providers can participate without being overwhelmed. Um, she's not sure that they're exactly know what they're being asked to do. And um, she used the example of the ages and stages questionnaire or the ASQ work um, and how to, you know, maybe train them to use that with their families in, in part of this process. And uh, that maybe um, one of the ideas that she talked about was that some of these community transitions teams might be able to help provide that type of information to providers. And along that same line, a Leavenworth County Child Care Director shared that their transition team has used kindergarten re readiness subgrant funding recently to extend ASQ training to providers in the community and also to provide some ASQ starter kits. And 20 providers attended the training and some who really didn't know what ASQ was to begin with, and then they were very willing to learn about it and start using that as a tool to work with their families in their future educations. And she just considered it uh, very much a win for their community to um, have that experience. A couple of ways about how information um, has been shared out recently on the toolkit. Um, last month in November, a team made up of several panel members and also a panel of providers who attended last year's January Kindergarten Readiness Summit um, gave a presentation at the KSDE annual conference on building successful transition experiences. And during that presentation, I shared some information on the components of the toolkit, on the um, MOU, its benefits to communities, and how to access it on the cabinet's website, and then also shared my contact information for any follow-up questions that they might have. Um, uh, and along with the kindergarten summit that I mentioned from last year, a follow-up retreat is being planned uh, for that in January of 2022 for all of those participants. And we plan to offer a session on the a work session on the toolkit to do um, the development of the MOU to kind of explain that and also the other components involved in the toolkit. So those conversations are ongoing. Uh, the work of the toolkit is evolving. And I think that it's only going to keep getting better as the word gets out more and more. And then we're always happy to serve in a support role um, to work with uh, them on anything they might need to help clarify all of that. Um, and the last piece that I have for you today is to announce um, another resignation. We have Rochelle Fiorito Ricard, 
who um, has resigned from the panel. She was working with United Way of the Plains and she has resigned from her position there and stepped down. So um, it is not necessarily, um, we don't have to replace her on the panel necessarily because she was categorized in the other um, category of uh, membership. And so uh, we, it's not necessary to replace her, but we will definitely miss her and thank her for the time that she served last year and um, part of this year on the panel. And so with that, I um, thank you for your time today. It's great to see everyone. I will be happy to answer any questions you have and then turn the meeting back over to whoever. Okay, well, I'll be whoever. Um, uh, let's see, are there any questions for Debbie? That was a good report. It, it is kind of uh, exciting to see this group I mean, the effort they're giving to the to the group is uh, really wonderful, I think, uh, and, and to have the, the broad base of participation. So anyway, any questions or suggestions for Debbie? Okay, I don't think we need to formally act on that resignation, do we? If we were electing someone, we would. Right. I don't think we need to formally act in this case. All right, uh, Melissa, it's down to you. Or up to, or up to you, I guess. Kim, uh, this is John Wilson with KAC. Uh, I wonder if I could bring up one thing prior to Melissa's update at the risk of backsliding on the agenda. Um, could I do that? Sure. I'm going to allow it, yes. Okay, great. And this is also at the risk of potentially upsetting, uh, upsetting whatever graphic designer laid out the annual report with CPPR. Because I was thinking about um, Terry's presentation about the, the data trust and looking at those... Um, top three or so reasons, there's uh, kind of a removal and thinking how that maps back to really uh, parents and families not being able to meet their basic needs. And I recall, uh, I think I, over a year ago, the, the, the cabinet made a recommendation to ask the governor and the legislature to do all that they can to remove restrictions to work and family support programs that help kids and parents and caregivers um, meet their basic needs. And um, I wonder if it's possible to, to kind of uh, reopen the recommendations section of the annual report uh, and add a new box for December where we can say that we, uh, we want to make that recommendation again, that the legislature and the governor do all they can to remove restrictions to child care assistance, cash assistance, and nutrition assistance and health care programs so that families can meet their basic needs or, or, or at least uh, uh, get closer to meeting their basic needs because I know the legislature will be um, addressing a lot of they well they have an opportunity to address a lot of these programs in the upcoming legislative session so I can put the text that I think was used last time around in the chat box um, or email it to you Melissa for um, e email it to me if um, for the purpose of the official language for the minutes if you want to read it for the purpose of discussion with, with your fellow cabinet members, that would be much appreciated. Yeah, so how about, I mean, so how about, I can, I'll read it and I'll, I'll, I'll make, so this will be my motion and I'll read it and then I guess we can have discussion after that. Yep, for sure. Okay, so uh, the cabinet recommends the governor and the Kansas legislature increase access to work and family support programs that help children and families meet their basic needs. Research clearly shows that children thrive when their basic needs are met and that parents and caregivers are better able to support children when their own basic needs are met. The cabinet believes current restrictions to child care assistance, cash assistance, nutrition assistance, and health insurance programs undercut the investments made through the CIF and blunt the efficacy of early childhood care and education programs. The 2019 comprehensive statewide needs assessment documents these concerns. So okay. I move that motion, that recommendation. All right. Leslie et al, second. All right, let's move to seconded. Um, I think we had some discussion about uh, whether this was uh, our purview at the time that we adopted this and resolved that, that it probably was within our purview to make such a recommendation, but uh, it is, we need to decide if we want to add that to the list of recommendations that we reviewed earlier. Kim, this is Melissa. If I may, John, we we obviously re referenced the 2019 needs assessment in that motion. We also updated in 2020. We, we did an updated needs assessment. Would it be appropriate to amend the motion to indicate both source 
document. I think that's a friendly amendment and I would support that. This is John. Does the second agree to adding that yes. language? Great idea, Melissa. Thanks. Okay. okay. So uh, with that motion as uh, amended now is before us. What discussion do we have? Excellent idea. I'm fully supportive. This is Monica. Okay. Any, any other cabinet member have a comment? I assume there'll be specific specific advocacy uh, efforts or planned around the, the, the basic proposition, John? Yeah, I think that's accurate. I'll, I can explain a little bit about what KAC and our partners uh, are looking at. I mean, there, there's kind of no shortage of opportunities. We think that there's a, an opportunity to remove uh, eligibility requirements to access child care assistance. Um, we can update the um, requirements for, for, for people pursuing secondary education to receive child care assistance. There's a, a, an employer child daycare tax credit that is uh, uh, that's that uh, that bill has already passed the House and Senate committees and just needs a vote on the, one of the floors. Um, there is also, I mean, we still are one of uh, a small number of states that hasn't expanded Medicaid to provide health insurance to more Kansans. There's actually also an opportunity to update uh, the CHIP eligibility guidelines. Uh, currently, Kansas has in statute that the eligibility is tied to 2008 poverty levels, which is, I think, unacceptable. Um, there, there is an opportunity to remove the sales tax on the statewide sales tax on groceries. I think that is a huge opportunity, in particular for family child care providers who buy their meals and snacks from grocery stores. I mean, I think this could save them thousands of dollars a year that they could put towards their own pay or towards quality improvements or any number of things to, to support their business. So, uh, so um, KAC has advocacy opportunities planned. And I would just say for anybody who's on the cabinet or anybody who is listening or watching this meeting, you can email me, John, J-O-H-N at KAC.org to express your interest in joining the campaigns to move these items. All right. Well, we're not specifically endorsing any one of those items, but it does seem to me that it was kind of kind of good to understand uh, in general what we're saying with this language. So correct. And I would say that um, to to interpret what this means for me in my role as executive director, I can carry the message. Um, generally, I can educate on the issues of of um, the basic need. It, it, topics. I can I can speak to what we know about their impact on children and families. That's different from lobbying efforts to say vote yes on this thing. But I, my role with a recommendation like this is to be able to say, you know, this is the work of the cabinet. This is what we've learned, and this is what we know um, is is disrupting families and, and, and express that, that resource for information that, that we can play. So I wanna be clear about um, appropriate roles for state agencies and all of that, but, but this would be, um, I, I would welcome this and I, I'll speak for the, the graphic design team to say they are very creative people and we'll find a way to make this work. All right. All right, any further questions or discussion on the motion? I think I probably ought to call a roll call vote on this. Yeah, uh, Lindsay, can you pull that slide back up? Deanne, you haven't gotten in your car yet. <laughs> or, you, or else you've got a permanent backdrop there behind you and you're fooling me, I don't know. No, I'm being rushed to the car, but I, I ah, wanted to- All right, it, let's like hurry here. Uh, <laughs> Uh, in favor of this motion, uh, Senator Erickson isn't with us. Leetta Felter? Yes. Deanne Owen Graham? Yes. Delise Hoffman? Yes. Monica Mernon? Yes. Terry Rice? Yes. Dr. Tyler Smith, I don't think, has joined She's us. Not, no. John Wilson? Yes. Kim Moore? Yes. All right. Thank you, John, for bringing that to our attention. Terrific. Um, um, Thank you. And do you have any, have you, is there anything left you haven't updated us on, Melissa? 
Um, just a couple closing comments. Um, one of the, I, I was thinking about this during the eight, the, a couple of the updates that you've heard um, when Justice Wall was, was speaking. I realized that our annual report has a call out box that, that speaks to a special project that we funded through CBCAP this year um, that I just, I wanna call some attention to. It, it was, um, funding for a group of Washburn Law School students to create a series of video trainings on the, the focused on um, family well-being and, and um, just what it, it, it's, it's actually, the, um, they're creating these as CLE, so, so attorneys can, can for free access these trainings and satisfy their ongoing education requirements, but really focused on um, um, the family well-being and, and, and how best to, to navigate the, the universe of family law and the situations our kids end up entangled in um, and become uh, effective partners and advocates for our kids. So we're, we're pretty excited about that. And um, so you can read more about it in the annual report. And then to dial in on the Build Back Better uh, remarks that Debbie made, we don't know what the finished product may look like if when all of those variables that exist with the, the, the process in Congress. But we do know that there is a lot of of chatter across the state about what certain elements might mean for child care providers in Kansas, particularly the, the family, licensed family um, care providers um, operating out of their homes. I just wanted to um, plant a flag that we really recognize the value of the mixed universe of providers that are um, contributing to our early childhood care and education system. And I will be a, a, a strong voice and I know our team of agency partners agrees. Um, I, I, I feel comfortable promising that we will ensure that the latitude that Kansas as a state has for crafting a plan to submit to the, the federal um, government to, to outline how we intend to use things like universal pre-K funds will recognize that we cannot give any one system or one um, funding area all of that money that we need a mixed delivery approach that will make sense for everyone currently operating and create a welcome, welcoming and um, and varied, you know, a, a vibrant system that will allow family voice and choice for, for what they want um, for their kids' experiences to, to look like. So I want to use this opportunity to make those remarks. Other than that, I will avoid a lot of other updates because the team has done such a great job and you have the annual report. I just want to close out the year with um, my, my gratitude for your engagement in our work and, and that that is not just those of you on our our cabinet, but, but those of you watching, um, the, the partners we work with are incredible. We have had a, a year of, um, you know, it's the pandemic kind of is that, that pervasive um, force that we all are reckoning with. And yet I look at the progress we've made and the good that has been done to, to further projects along and, and keep the, the well-being of our children um, top of mind. So just a note of thanks to everybody, our support team, my own staff here at the cabinet, um, all of you who are volunteering your time for the cabinet and our partners. Um, thank you and I, I wish you all um, peace and, and joy over the, the holiday season ahead and look forward to seeing you in the new year. So thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And the, the uh, schedule of meetings has just been posted up there. I think we've seen it before, but if not, you might want to jot down those, those dates. And this year, we're not going to spring an April surprise. That Friday is is not in conflict with Easter, so it's not Good Friday. So um, we, we did a little bit better job of vetting the, 
the calendar for you. Um, again, virtual until further notice, we're sort of tracking along the general guidance for um, executive branch agencies. We continue to um, have a directive from the governor to work from home when possible. And um, I, I just think uh, we will we will comply with with best practices. So the virtual meetings seem to be working for us. Um, I look forward to convening in person with you all, um, but for the time being, we'll continue virtually. All right, well, let me also uh, add my uh, season's greetings to everyone, best wishes as we move into this, uh, this time, holiday season together and uh, everybody stay safe out there and uh, we'll be back together after the first of the year. We're adjourned.